So uh, we'll get started on the talks by our panelists. The brief we provided to our panel was that uh, we've just completed the engagement and impact assessment exercise this year. And with the exercise fresh in our mind, we wanted to have a look back on what worked, what didn't, what, how universities might use this exercise ongoing as a way to strengthen pathways to implement institutional strategies and also about how stories generating from this exercise can be used to bring about greater awareness with the public on the value of the tertiary sector and research in general. And uh, when we were designing these, we of course didn't know the whole thing uh, of the grants issues that have come up, the national interest tests that have come up. So I'm sure it's going to be a lively conversation. Uh, we'll start off from the left to all the way to the right. So Professor Michael Cardi Hall. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Um, um, yeah, so uh, what, what I might do is just take you through some of the experience that we had with the uh, ENI uh, pro process. Um, I think what was alluded to earlier was the fact that um, ever since the NISA statement, there's been a real shift in showing uh, that, that we're actually having an impact, that the outcomes of the funding the government gives for universities is not just about doing publications and citations, that we've actually got to have some societal impact. Personally, I agree with that. I think we get a big chunk of money, um, and we have a responsibility to, to demonstrate that we're actually delivering on that to, to, the, to the Australian taxpayer. Um, so I think in terms of a process, I think it, it's important um, <clears throat> that we show that. Um, but there's, um, just looking at my notes down here, <clears throat> um, and, and the ANU is really committed to, to trying to achieve that. Now for us though, it is actually quite interesting how we do that. Part of the reason being is because we have such a large proportion which is in the humanities and social sciences, and a particular large portion which is around public policy, and that's how we often want to be seen to be actually having an impact. How you actually gauge having an impact in public policy is an ongoing challenge, and perhaps Glenn can give us an insight as to how we might do that more in the, in the future. Um, and, <clears throat> and it's something that we continuously struggle with. Um, but it's something we have to be get more on the front foot about. On the, on the sciences and the, and the STEM side, it, it is a little, little easier, but again, we have to be much more proactive about it. Um, now, what I want to perhaps do is just take you through some of the lessons learned that we had. Now, my role in the, um, in the E&I process for the ANU was chair of the steering committee. Um, and it was in my substantive role at Pro-Vice Chancellor for Innovation, uh, and Sally was on that as well. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it was, an interesting process, to say the least. Um, if I reflect back as to what, what went well and what didn't went well, go well, um, well, we put a, a governance framework in place. We had a working parties that sat under that, and that was the responsibility of the Research Services Division. So I think we had a framework there. One thing that we did do is we started way, way too late. Um, this is something that came up, we sort of knew about it, but none of us really had a sense of the magnitude of what it was about. And so I think you know, lesson number one is start early. Um, <clears throat> but we know that now. But it's more than that now. I think what we've realised is that you don't just start early. You don't ever actually stop. You've actually got to keep going. It's a continuous process. So I think that for us was, was lesson number one. Um, lesson number two, I think, is that you've got to keep that governance framework in place as much as you can, but also then uh, actually have the resources you needed to do it. The other thing that we didn't do is put, is put in place early enough the sort of people we needed to capture what was going on. By and large, what you're talking about is capturing stories, case studies. Um, when you try and ask an academic to write a case study, you end up with a grant application. <laughs> and that really, you know, that was one of the biggest struggles, is actually extracting it out, translating it into something that would be meaningful for someone that really understand it and actually would want to read it. Um, and so I think, you know, having the right skill sets that can engage with the academics and actually then try and actually translate it into something meaningful was also something. Um, here I have to stop and also reflect on our colleagues at the AIC. I think they invented a process which was just challenging to say the least. Um, I've spoken to many of my other colleagues around the other G8 universities and they all had the same throw up their hands in horror. I think there's some fundamental I issues with it around the way they use the FOR codes, how they put the FOR codes around disciplines rather than outputs and, and it became really problematic in terms of classifying where those case studies went to. 
So that's another another loan. We fed that back to the to the ARC. We'll see where we get to on the next round. Um, having the other big thing that we had real problems with was uh, actually getting the, our academics and researchers to engage, uh, to understand, and understand that this was actually against a timeline. Um, part of the issue here was the timing of the whole thing, and there was a whole range of other submissions, grant applications that went in, and of course being academics they prioritised this, and this was not on high on their priority list. So getting to prioritise it was a real problem. Um, getting them to really contribute in a timely way was a real problem. But again, that was a function of starting late. So they sort of go hand in hand. Um, I think having gone through it once, we, you know, we've learned a lot about how we might actually engage more on a, on a, say, on a continuous basis with our academics. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is actually, with the, unit, with the ANU, uh, because we're a very divulged institution, um, uh, for those who are at the ANU, you'll understand um, that we, you know, whilst we could do things centrally in the research services division, a lot of the action goes on in our colleges and our schools, and then the, the disjoint between the colleges and schools. I won't bore you with that. That's something that we're, is a continuous struggle for us, but that's, that's just something we need to do. Um, I've done that, I've done that, um, I've done that. Uh, finding the right people, finding the right authors. Next steps. Okay, so I think it really is we've really just got to keep communicating as an institution the importance of this exercise. It is not going to go away. It is going to be there and we need to actually keep <coughs> expanding that um, We need to really, I think it was alluded to just now, actually reflect this in our promotions criteria. Um, so that, you know, it, if you put forward a case study and you actually generate the case study that can be demonstrated, you can count it towards your promotions. And I think that's an important step that we've got to embed it in our other systems as well. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I think is also to show that this, this exercise of you know, creating these case studies and creating these impact statements is that we should actually look at uh, making sure we can reuse that material. It's just not a one-off thing. We can use it into publicity, we can use it into a whole heap of other annual reports so that it becomes really part and parcel of what we're doing. So the big step now is to take what was a one-off, very painful exercise, not wait until it comes around again, but actually make it part and parcel of our overall uh, business in terms of research management and showing our impact, not also in terms of counting our citations and all the other aspects that we have to, but actually making it part and parcel of what we do on an ongoing basis. Um, and we survive the process. <laughs> Thanks, Yeah, thank you. And I can't get away with what Michael said, um, but I do agree with what you said. And uh, look, I thought there's going to be a number of panel presentations today, and uh, I thought I'd give a few personal, I guess, um, ideas on my, my uh, where I think the value and the risks lie with this whole uh, metrics around impact and engagement. And certainly, rankings and ratings are important to our landscape, but uh, I really seriously wonder about the long-term utility. Of, uh, of these exercises as we go forth, and particularly the time and effort that goes into um, ERA uh, as well as impact and engagement. Um, I think um, one of the things that, um, or one of the sayings that I've, I hold pretty close is that we can't manage um, what we can't measure. And uh, But there's a risk in only um, evaluating on what we can measure because a lot of the things that are really important for universities are things that we can't measure particularly well. And I think the real risk is if we, um, if that, that universities can manage according to what is measurable and forget what's really important sometimes. Um, so I think there's, I guess what I'm saying is look, there's a risk of um, these rankings perverting what universities are about or should be about. Um, and to chase the rankings and ratings, that's great, but uh, I think we should remember what our core uh, missions and uh, visions are and uh, the roles of universities. So that's um, that's the first point. Um, ERA, I think, is a good example. So I'll just um, digress slightly from impact and engagement. And uh, we've, um, I guess, one of the miracles of Australian research in universities is how quickly we've improved research since 2010. If you look at the number of fives and fours, you know, above and well above world class, um, we've done that in an incredibly short period of time with no extra money. Um, one almost you know, wonders whether that's a real increase in, in excellence or 
or just the way we actually report the data. Um, and so I wonder also, I guess, about the continued use of those ranking systems and uh, just how good we'd look if other academics around the world were chasing citations at quite the same rate that, that we are at the moment. So I think um, and its, it's value has been, I think, really important, um, but I'm just wondering whether we're losing the utility. And of course, it's a question now, we've got a whole range of uh, global ranking systems in disciplines. Uh, do we really need to um, continue what is a very um, intensive exercise every three years in terms of ERA. Um, impact, look, I, th I think, um, and this, this goes to the importance in what you can measure and, and also what you can compare, and uh, I think this is a real challenge in terms of um, impact in trying to assess economic versus social versus health versus, and I'm not sure the value in, in doing that um, in some respect. The, to me, the value of the exercise is we are going to have and do have for institutions great narratives and stories on just the benefit that research provides to Australian um, society. So, you know, the national interest sort of test um, shouldn't be as loud as perhaps it has been in the last few weeks when I think the impact stories come out. And uh, the one that rings in my ear every time uh, was a presentation on one, one ARC project in, I think, the mid-90s that uh, was given a couple of hundred thousand dollars um, that's returned uh, tens of billions of dollars of Jamison cell, I think it's called, on coal. And uh, just that one project um, has had an impact and a return greater than all the, you know, the investment in ARC funding since that time. So those are brilliant stories, and I think they're the things, that, that's a real value of the impact um, assessment cycle moving forward. What I wonder about is what we're going to put up in three years' time if we're asked to do impact again, because I can tell you at my university before, we'll be putting up pretty much the same stories and narratives because you know we're, we're going back 15 years uh, to the fundamental research that's created an impact. It won't be that different in three years' time. So the actual timing of that uh, will be interesting um, in terms of seeing whether or not there's uh, new changes. Um, engagement, yeah, look, of course, this is just how we get impact. Um, and I really query um, just the value of of the engagement exercise for that. Um, one good query, well, what happens if you get a great engagement score but your impact is pretty terrible? I mean, what does that mean? And, and, and really, it's impactful engagement. Um, why do we need both? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. And of course, just how we measure engagement to me is a real mystery and I, I think it might be not as clear as it could be to the ARC as well, which is why they've been opened up for you know, any metric you'd like to add. Uh, in terms of justifying you know, the engagement that the institutions had. So I guess, look, my, my final remarks are, look, I think you know, the ratings are fantastic and the impact stories are going to be really wonderful. Um, I'm not so sure about engagement. And I think the next engagement exercise might be somewhat different from the one we just went through. But time will tell. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to take a bit of a different angle to look at uh, impact and engagement. And that is as an academic preparing one of the submissions for the impact statement. I was asked to do this for um, FOR code 06, which is Biological Sciences, and it was a real struggle to come up with the idea of what we would actually do for the impact. So we sat down with the team that would be of academics that were involved in this FOR code, and we started by looking at what are our impacts. And that was really difficult. You would think that would be obvious because we would hope that our research is having an impact, particularly when I'm in the Institute for Applied Ecology. <laughs> so you would think that would be obvious, but it turned out we only had a few stories where we actually had evidence of having impact. And that was really where we started. What are the stories where we have that evidence? And some of that evidence was publications with industry partners and where that had actually been um, involved in a management issue based on um, um, finding different species in, in a you know the, in a stream and um, cutting out the invasive species that type of thing. Um, it it really was hard to find those stories, and so we really had to work backwards from that impact to then looking at what was the evidence for that impact, so that we'd actually say this is really something that's had an, an impact. And then what led to that impact? So what was our approach? And it was interesting because when we did that, it looked like we actually had a strategy for achieving impact, <laughs> but we didn't start out that way. 
So from that as, um, assessment, we really came up with a strategy for moving forward for the next time we have to do this, we will have that strategy, that approach to impact. It's come up with sort of a pipeline for working out what we need to do to have impactful <coughs> research. And it really is about establishing those relationships with industry and government very early on and making sure that we are actually communicating so that we have things that are going to meet the requirements of our industry or government partner, but also our requirements as academics. Um, so it's a different way of thinking of our research. And I think that's really good. That's something that's <coughs> been really good that's come out of this exercise. Um, but coming up with that narrative and pulling out the evidence from those other academics was really difficult, so I agree with you there. Um, and it was, you know, we started this quite late again and it really needed to start much earlier and thinking about that, that evidence and um, getting that in place. But I think what this means for academics moving forward is that I would think in the ideal world we'd have a balance between fundamental research feeding into the applied research and going back into fundamental research. That's the ideal, but I think as academics we get caught up in, okay, let's, we've found out something from the fundamental research. We're such curious people that we just stay in that fundamental area and don't actually move to application. So I think this is making that, that movement to application much more obvious. And so I hope that we will, particularly in the Institute for Applied Ecology, be doing that more often. I think also it means that we have to think about the types of funding we're going for. And even if we're going for ARC, I'm on the um, College of Experts, and one of the things that in the discovery grants that will separate those that are really successful um, from those that are still probably fundable, but perhaps just on that borderline, is the benefit. And that basically comes down to impact. So I find there are a lot of grants sort of have this wishy-washy benefit statement. But those that really get over the line are those that really have a very strong benefit statement. And that comes back to what you think the intended impact's going to be. So I think this exercise is going to help with, with ARC discovery grants as well. So also thinking about other types of funding, so category two, three, and four. And I think that would be really important for those relationships with industry and government. And starting those relationships is really important too, so building that trust. And that's what we found from the stories that we put forward, is that those relationships were built very early on in the project and they've continued on so that, um, yeah, that trust was there and they were coming to us, so the government or industry partners were coming to us for answers. And that's how we had that impact. It's also about asking the appropriate questions. So thinking about our research a little bit differently because as I said, we get, as academics get stuck in that fundamental research area and forget about the applied. And it's quite a different question when we're looking at applied research. So our government and industry partners have quite different questions that they want answered to what we as academics would actually ask. So it's thinking about those appropriate questions. And we really need to have that closer connection between the research we're doing and translation. But at the same time, we need to make sure that if we're going to have research that has an impact for society, that we're also maintaining that, that rigour in our research. And that's where we have to have that balance between publication and, and the actual application as well. So I think what, what does this mean for universities? I'm putting on my director hat at the moment. I think we need to think about the strategy for attaining impact, as I said, it's building those relationships, going after the appropriate types of funding. But we also need to have incentives that will mean that our academics will actually do this and engage in the exercise. And that's what we didn't have when we started this exercise. Because they were saying to me, well, why would I waste my time on this ex exercise when it's not going to help me get a promotion. It's not going to help me with my performance ratings. Why would I do it? Um, so I think we need to make sure that that is actually an incentive to do. But the good thing that's coming out of this, as the others have said, we have the stories now to tell. And um, I think those stories are quite powerful as well. So um, there's lots to, to having those good impact statements. 
Now, I found that the process was quite painful and I agree that the engagement side of things just seemed like I was doubling over what I was saying in the impact because you don't get impact without engagement. So um, I think if they could change that and we just had the impact statement, that would be great. Um, the, the process has given us the, the stories for our outreach and attracting additional funding as well because it means that we can go to industry or government and say, well, this is where we've actually had success and, and, and they'll take that on board. Um, and I think it's also good for the public perception that they see that the money that's going into research is actually having an impact and that's really important in the environment we're in at the moment. And I think I'll leave it there. I'll look at the clicker. Uh, so when you get an invite to do a speech at 3.30 on a Friday afternoon <laughs> and you're aware that there's a lot of people who've been to Christmas parties, you do get a little bit anxious, so I've bought a PowerPoint with a fair bit of imagery, um, which I'm not going to read out to you, but we'll talk around. This is known as cheating. <laughs> <laughs> My mother would talk to you about preparation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I, I run effectively a platform for engagement and impact for Federation University. Um, it's a pleasure, pleasure to be here, Lee Sullivan, who was my DVCR, uh, who I reported to for two years, and hired me, so thank you, Lee. It's been great. Um, so basically, Fed Uni, we uh, run a tech park. Uh, effectively, it started out 20 years ago as a, as a land play and a, and a facility play, uh, and it's basically evolved into something different. So uh, it's now a place that um, features all of those um, activities, and most importantly, uh, generates eight to nine million dollars annually in profit for the university. Um, I am very pleased to report to Lee, so this is almost like a, me catching up with Lee moment. Um, yesterday, the VC signed off on uh, us reinvesting uh, 20 to 25 percent of all income back into research partnerships. Um, so that's something Lee and I have stood for quite some time on doing. So, what's the tech park? 1,450 jobs. Uh, it's actually 54 enterprises, not 65. So I apologise for that error. Um, Generates uh, $100 million in capital assets. Uh, it's 38,000 square metres of commercial space. Uh, and mm. I suppose sitting there, you've got uh, IBM, one of two centres. You've got the State Revenue Office at the top. Large health providers in here, uh, applied manufacturing here, and then IBM number three at the top. So they're about half of our assets. Um, but effectively, uh, it's, you know, it generates $300 million annually in economic output in the region, in an economy that's $10 billion. I like the slide. So these are the ones, these are the current partners that you could recognise. So uh, IBM, Serco, largest outsourced uh, provider in the, in the world. And uh, we're not dealing with them on the prisons part, we're dealing with them on their government uh, ATO and call centre part. Uh, Berry Street health providers, uh, Esther, so half of all triple zero phone calls in Victoria dealt with out of the tech park in Ballarat. Um, HRL, uh, who are Boeing, uh, so large companies. The blues represent existing research partnerships, uh, so partnerships that Lee set up and which are starting to roll out this year. Uh, the reds are my dance card for 2019. Um, but effectively what we're saying is, if you want to be on the tech park, uh, you can't just be there as a tenant. You must be engaged in a partnership. It's either got to be around workforce development, uh, it's got to be around student placements, or it's got to be around research partnerships. Effectively, we have three jewels in the crown that actually drive the demand for the tech park. Uh, it's a, and it's three, these three institutes here. So it's 30, uh, these guys and girls do data federation. So overlay multi layers of data sets, uh, GIS, which is obviously incredibly important for a whole lot of private sector companies and public sector. Uh, ICSL, Internet Com Security Laboratory, uh, they sit across, uh, well, they do a lot of work for Canberra agencies and also Victorian government agencies. Uh, and a fair bit of private sector, including a number of, number of large banks. And then Chow, so um, algorithms. So between the three of them, uh, that becomes a really strong offering in terms of why we're able to attract businesses into the technology park. One of the other things we do is basically we have a partnership that we've been running for 20 years with IBM and Concentrix. Uh, it's called the ProfPrac, which you all know about. But most importantly, uh, students engage uh, for two shifts a fortnight in IBM over their four year period. So rather than taking a year off, they're actually going through IBM all the way through. And the beauty of that is about 70% of them go on to be employed by IBM. 
So we have 650 odd IBM employees in Ballarat, which is quite amazing when you think about it. It's one of three, they have two of their four service centres uh, for the Asia Pacific in Ballarat, and it's wholly driven out of the skills partnership with the university. Changing focus, uh, this is basically Lee and my strategy that we've um, implemented over the last, last two years, which is around that student placement. Uh, we are basically full. Um, and there. So I'm going to just quickly run through some projects here and then I'll come to some evidence about why we, why we can say that there's impact happening. Uh, I don't know if you know, um, Gippsland coal, coal powered fire station shut down a year and a half ago. Uh, the government was probably a little bit short on responses so uh, they've basically agreed that they want us to transplant the Ballarat Technology Park model down to the Latrobe Valley. So 350 kilometres the other side of the state. It's a delightful four hour drive which I'm doing <laughs> once every two weeks. Um, but this is a great project, but most importantly, this is the new model for technology park for us as a university. And it's very much around embedding research practices into the technology park. So it'd be much more of a, of a research um, centre and, and, and a lifeboat, shall we say, for the university where businesses will come and, and participate. Um, and obviously there's very strong government funding around all of those initiatives. So um, the, the front end is around the capital and then the back end is the support around actually funding research partnerships. Flecno development, this uh, is a project that's literally finishing as we speak. Uh, huge uh, facilities to form a TAFE building. Uh, this is the old welding building where every fitter and turner in Ballarat was taught over the last 80 years. Uh, it's now a technology park, so Serco are putting a 245 seat call centre in there, which is basically dealing with all of the non-emergency triple zero calls. Uh, but that's 500 jobs. So it's a 24 hour call centre that will, on average, 180, 190 people for two shifts and then 60 overnight. Um, there's 500 people in Ballarat that will be in employment as a result of this. The way that we attracted Serco was not because of the facility, it was about access to student workforce and it was about access about them, about as, a, as an agency that does outsource government services, they need to actually start getting ahead of that. And so um, we're working very closely with them. We've got an MOU in place with regards to uh, developing a, shall we call it, um, a citizen focused service research partnership um, and it's really about what's the impact of outsourcing on government service what does it mean what does it do uh, that's black imagery um, and part of what we're trying to do is actually change the way that people see technology um, so it's about that groovy uh, part that's that's there we also host runway which um, I've got images but uh, so most importantly co-working space accelerator programs uh, and then at the top there's, we're hosting the third MIT makerspace in Australia. Uh, so in Ballarat, that's uh, the first in Victoria. Uh, we're incredibly proud about that because it's about dragging our students and academics out of their buildings into partnerships with, with industry. And so this is not, um, I've got to be careful because I'm on level five here, but um, we're not actually about startups. What we're about is actually assisting large businesses to evolve. So what we want to do is have businesses bring their systemic problems into the, into the facility and actually rather than paying a consultant like me, um, actually taking a team of six people in there for three weeks, running through the innovation program itself and coming up with the problem themselves and taking it back into their enterprise. Um, so that's, um, we think that's going to be a very powerful project. Uh, it opened two months ago. Evidence of impact, I'll just quickly talk about it. Uh, everything above the line is average annual output growth, so it's hovering about 6% for ICT, and uh, jobs growth is on the horizontal axis. So ICT over a seven year period, seven to 14, and this has continued, are basically hovering upon 6% annual output growth and 2% job growth uh, in the region. Um, and to be honest, that's a snapshot that's very unusual for a regional centre in Australia. Um, the other thing I'll just quickly point out, um, this is a location quotient, so everything above the line means it's a net exporter activity. Ballarat is the only regional centre in Australia that actually slightly exceeds the demand for ICT service facilitation in the economy. So it's an unbelievable story. Most regional centres hover around about 0 0.8, 0 0.7. Uh, so for us, what we say is this is clear impact that uh, we're able to actually meet all of the needs of some of these very, very large businesses. Job growth, I'll quickly jump through that. This is important. Uh, basically, information media telecommunications 
every job is worth $250,000 a year in terms of economic output and activity. So one of the reasons that the sector is doing so well and creates such strong economic activity is you've got a lot of other services that have economic output that are much lower, uh, where there are much larger numbers of people, but you've got ICT um, where you've got there. The other thing I'll highlight is financial insurance services. Every person in that sector is earning $400,000 a year or generating $400,000 a year of benefit for the company. So we've specifically targeted that. Um, so we've, using, we've used this sort of logic in terms of why we're targeting particular enterprises to come into the technology park for partnerships. The higher the job um, value creation, the more likely they are to invest in research partnerships. And uh, this is just the last slide, so I'll quickly finish. Uh, basically, the Ballarat economy is a microcosm of Australia. It's thumping along, uh, very strong economic growth. And ICT, between 14 and 31, it's going to go up to 1,400 jobs. Uh, the Serco thing that I've just um, talked to you about uh, is going to take us up to 1,200 by 2019. So, that's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that'll be so useful, mate. Thanks Sorry. very much. <laughs> I don't have any slides. Um, so I have uh, just four uh, quick points. Um, as you can probably tell by my accent and bio, I, um, I moved out to Australia from the UK. One of the things I thought I'd never have to do again would, was uh, impact uh, and, uh, and, and engagement. Um, so I was thrilled to see that, that it followed me here. But I, I do think when you, you think about the, the, the UK's uh, REF impact scheme. It's important, I think, to understand what some of the drivers were and what else was going on at the same time. So one of the drivers was the whole democratisation movement of universities. So it comes in at the same time as open access publishing. So green and, and gold access for publishing. So in the next breath, if your work is not open access, you haven't made it open access, you're not going to be able to submit it. So it, it's, it was on the back of that. And the other thing that happened to democratise universities was a huge movement around public engagement and a massive amount of funding that the UK government put into UK universities for beacons of public engagement. And there were sort of 10 regional uh, beacons that, that you could bid for. And this was not about sort of passive knowledge transfer. This was much more about creating the conditions for co-production of knowledge uh, and for knowledge exchange, so, so much more sort of um, active strategies. And I'll, I'll come back uh, in point four to why I think that's important. But uh, so from that point of view, impact uh, and engagement case studies for actual real money in the REF were, were a kind of uh, obvious follow on to that. Um, my second point is that I think one of the things that focusing on research impact and on case studies does, is it does give a value within the academy to research that might not otherwise be valued. And it, it overcomes that, that whole division between pure theoretical knowledge and applied knowledge. And that actually saw, um, certainly within the UK system, I think, researchers who had, had, who had been told, your, your work just doesn't have a value, were suddenly re-embraced, it did have a monetary value. That too, I think, is important, um, that quite often what publics, in inverted commas, value is not necessarily what institutions value. Um, my third point is around kind of academic resistance to the whole sort of impact thing. And the first point about that, of course, is it's change. So we know that academics as a tribe, are pretty resistant to change. So, so that is going to make anything you change difficult for a start. Um, there's then also, uh, I, th I think, ar around change, the issue is that I think sometimes academics see the whole impact agenda as valuing part of their research that they don't necessarily value. And that's something that came very strongly both at Queen's and at ANU out of writing impact statements. There was a fairly steady pushback around, but that's, that's not what my research was about, or that's not the important bit, you haven't got the right bit. So it's about trying to convince people that, that actually what matters for the purposes of these exercises is not necessarily what is going to go into a 
four in, in UK terms or a five in, in Australian era terms journal. It, it's about something different. There is a suggestion that it, it dilutes the focus of the, of the research process. Now, I'm less convinced about that than I used to be. I think by the time I was leaving Queen's, we were doing our second uh, round of case studies. They had to be in the main different. And we were seeing sort of second generation thinking around impact. And I don't think it did. I think that it didn't dilute it. The way people drafted their research and conceived of their research was that they wanted to be able to create an impact story out of it. And so even if it was really pure research, they were looking for the angle that would, would give them uh, impact. Um, so I do think that the, there has to be an effort to encourage academics to embrace impact, because they really are the only people that can push it forward. You can put in whatever structure you like around actually writing the studies or pushing impact forward, but they're the people who have to be prepared to say, yes, this is what my research is about. Yes, it might have an application in relation to this group and, and, uh, and, and pull them in. Um, if you look at the, uh, I think it's called Research England now, or, or something equally, it used to be um, UKRI, it, the, all the research councils there have what's called a Pathways to Impact, and that's a very useful document for getting people to think about what their impact might be. Uh, at Queen's we used to have a series of academics who could just write impact pathways, whether they were engaged in that research or not. You could just drop the grant around to them and say, can you do me a pathway to impact? And, and they would do it. Because it's not that hard, really. But, um, you're just looking for a range of different audiences, a range of different vehicles, and ways in which you, you, you might do it. Um, you do have to incentivize it. One of the ways of incentivizing it, I think, is to create a series of impact accelerator small grants. Because although people say they don't like it, Actually, there is something that every academic likes about impact. There really is, believe me. That newspaper interview, standing up at that conference, or watching someone else stand up and present their research, being able to recount how it resulted in policy change, or a new policy debate, or whatever. Most of them love it. Um, and then I suppose my last point is, if you were to, to look at university websites, the stories universities tell about themselves in the UK now, compared with what they said about themselves in, say, 2012, they are transformed. And they're transformed around stories about research. And I think in an era where we're told it's the rise of populism, expert knowledge doesn't matter, expert knowledge is under threat, why should we pay for this sort of thing? Being able to tell the narrative to the taxpayer, to government, and to other interested parties about why this is exciting, why you would want it to carry on happening, why you would actually want to go to university and be part of it, I think is a, is a really important story. It does come with costs. There is a certain infrastructure that has to go in. Somebody has to maintain those stories. They've got to be high production quality. Somebody has to write and collate them. Activity has to be tracked. So really, I guess if we were organised, we'd have sorted out our stories for next time and you'd be looking to incentivise those. And certainly by the time I was leaving Queen's, we had our 2021 stories sorted out and we were looking at what 25, 26 might be in terms of identifying early things that were coming up and thinking about trying to, trying to track them. You, you do need a whole measuring infrastructure around what's the engagement been, how do you translate engagement into impact. But if you get it right, I think it's massively exciting. Beats being a doctrinal lawyer any day. Uh, thank you very much. Um, being a, a W is always last, and the C's you know, start the thing. Uh, so at this end, I'm sure Shelley shares this concern. Yeah, always. Uh, and especially on a Friday afternoon. There's so much we could say, but let me try and make a, f a few points. I did want to comment on, on the Federation University Technology Park. I took the head of the universities uh, of the Europe, European Universities Association uh, there to have a private secret visit once because she was interested in what the non-Group of Eight did. Every time she came to Australia, the Group of Eight would drag her around Parkville and Kensington and so on. Yeah. And she wanted to know what the standing of other Australian universities was.
followers and what they do. And she was absolutely mightily impressed by oh, thank God. I wasn't sure where that was going. Use, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and she got to talk to some of the IBM people there and, yeah. Uh, yeah. and so on and said, you really do have a good system, don't you? All your universities are universities, uh, which she says not true in Europe and not true in the United States. Uh, so she came away because of that, that tech bug with uh, a, a, a enhanced impression of our universities generally, quite apart from individual ones within the system. Uh, and in Canberra, we're doing a bit of that now. People here might be aware of the UNSW uh, New City Campus that's uh, taking over the CIT, a significant part of the CIT area that uh, a and &E was very annoyed by. But I think it's a great, um, a great development. Uh, and, and they're s steaming ahead on a, on a, on a federation-type model, and they're very aware of the federation model. I've spoken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I'm pleased that that was part of the, um, of the presentation. But I, I'm uh, president of the Academy of, of the Australian Council of Learned Academies and of the Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, and I was going to take a slightly different view from their perspective, because most of the members there are senior research scholars, and they have a strong view on, on the excellence focus, much more than the impact and engagement focus. But they also take the view that, um, uh, that, that the need to, uh, well, to put it bluntly from their viewpoint, provide cover for what they want to do is pretty important, and they see participation, the impact, and engagement, and the metrics, and getting it right, and so on. Uh, important in general, because uh, <laughs> one phrase that was used was, well, it's red meat to the cave dwellers on the back bench of the coalition. Uh, that is, if you show you're doing good things, then this sort of, you know, Simon Birmingham uh, dismissal of humanities research uh, uh, starts to be more, more difficult and less, less appealing uh, to them. I do note in passing, though, that the, the first humanities research grant that was uh, dismissed by Simon Birmingham was one on culture at the Straits of Gibraltar. And I note also that last week uh, the Brexit EU agreement almost collapsed because of misunderstandings over culture at the, state, at the Straits of Gibraltar. <laughs> uh, and if you look at the titles, uh, I, I did dig them out, if you look at the titles of the research of people like Elizabeth Blackburn on, uh, where is it, I had it here somewhere, yeah, single cell pond dwellers, <laughs> or Peter Doherty's was choreomeningitis in mice, then I would have thought the pub test might be a bit of a problem for them, but uh, fortunately um, the Nobel Prize Committee did find that impressive in both cases. Uh, so that to have cover for that sort of research, uh, yes, they can try and translate that into English and have a bit of assistance from the, from the research uh, managers, uh, but equally they have cover for uh, you know, the splendid and splenetic um, silliness of much academic research. It's absolutely crucial. You've got to maintain the core, and that's certainly what a lot of uh, the fellows of the academies uh, do say. Indeed, after a period where I worked at Universities of Australia, I came back to the ANU and wandered into the Coombs building and uh, uh, went to look after some friends who were in the philosophy department there, it was like a number three, four philosophy department in the world. And it was rather wonderful where there were the sort of these, you know, people with bicycle shorts and their hair all wild and rather cross-eyed and had trouble looking you in the face because they were thinking and stuff like that. <laughs> And I knew I was back in a real university. It was really pleasing after trotting around Capitol Hill dressed in suits and, and, and uh, trying to convince ministers of the importance of something like a philosophy department. And yet all you've got to do is look at what happened with, uh, uh, with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and you begin to realise the importance of a philosophy department. Mm -hmm. Where do we get our ethical stances from and how do we understand them? Uh, and that's beginning to be clear too. At Ecola what we're doing is um, we're putting together uh, projects about three a year. We used to try and do more and they took too long and were, were too many. We're doing about three or four multidisciplinary projects a year from each of the academies that are our constituents. The Academy of Science, Academy of Engineering, the Academy of Humanities and the Academy of Social Sciences. And we have to have equal representation in every project from each academy. So they're genuinely equal multidisciplinary projects. Even where they're things like precision medicine or energy storage or whatever, it's still a genuinely multidisciplinary exercise. So you're getting 
things like those ethical issues, those behavioural issues, those social impacts, alongside the technological analysis, the, the rigorous modelling of, of the development of an area. Uh, and it's proving quite, quite stimulating. And we've got a lot of resistance there. There's still always two steps forward, one back. Uh, but we're thinking that's another important way forward to uh, help with engagement. Because what we became aware of, we, we looked at about four speeches from retiring heads of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And each of them made a speech as to how universities had failed them. And it seemed almost obligatory for a retiring Prime Ministerial Department head. And they said, it's all the disciplinary stuff. All you do is give us partial, unreadable, stuff. We haven't got the time or the ability to see what that means for us. And so the idea was to bring some more congregation of disciplinary knowledge into a multidisciplinary context on the problems that they were really facing and help them develop that understanding. And so we were, we were quite sort of challenged by if people at the top who were advising the Prime Minister thought, why bother with the universities? Uh, then uh, this was something that uh, we, we sought to overcome. I had the same experience once a couple of years back in the, in the Abbott, when they had an Abbott government. I did a review uh, of employment programs for the Abbott government, uh, for the cabinet, and I had a team of about 20 people, half of whom had PhDs. I asked them to provide various uh, overviews of the issues, uh, the posi main positions that were being pursued on changing employment uh, policy and the like. The first briefs that I got were from the other central agencies. They went out and they spoke to people in, if they were in, in this case we were in the Department of Finance, they went and spoke to Prime Minister and Cabinet, Treasury, um, uh, and uh, or the industry department and the employment department. But then they also, when I said, well, this is just a particular view, it's a central agency view, so they went and spoke to other line departments. They went out and spoke to health and transport and places like that. And then I said, well, that's just the Commonwealth view. Isn't there something more that outside of Canberra, you know, the Canberra bubble? And they went off and spoke to state governments uh, and started with the central agencies and moved on to line departments. So we gradually got wider and wider. We find is what about international perspectives? And they went and looked at the OECD work and the IMF work, etc. Never once, even though half of them were PhDs, did they go to the academic literature. I had to force them to go and look at academic literature on, for instance, emerging ideas on employment programs, evidence on incentive structures and behaviour from different types of employment programs. And yet, and my point here is, these are our PhDs in there. These are PhDs from our universities who themselves were not engaged with a university way of thinking into their work life beyond what was in their brain already. Now, that's something, and I'm sure that was a terrific, and it was a terrific contribution. But why they didn't continue to engage with us either abstractly through lit searches or by coming and talking to university units and so on is a big issue for us and partly what this engagement impact agenda is, uh, is seeking to uh, change and enhance. And so it's important for me, I think, in, in how we proceed on this, that industry be defined broadly to include government, to include the community sector, uh, and not just private business, and even within private business, not just big business but also small business, particularly through their associations and representatives. So that's one thing that I, I, I hope will emerge in, in the way we proceed with uh, engagement and impact. Um, another is the definition of, of how we measure engagement and impact. Of course, there's a long-standing problem. The metrics are very science-oriented, so that you can measure patents, you can measure spending on research laboratories and so on. Uh, we try and deal with that through case studies of the humanities and social science type impact and the like. Uh, even though this has been resisted along the way, uh, uh, newspaper and uh, journal and publication citations. So that social sciences, for instance, operate as much through the conversation or through uh, the Australian Financial Review uh, as, as they do through going to the patent office. And the problems there are things like, well, you know, what's a, what's a quality? 
citation as opposed to just any old citation. But it's interesting that that's emerging reasonably well. Even in research excellence now, QS has begun to uh, compile its list of quality publishers for books. So that the humanities who believe in books rather than journal articles now can have an index that is seriously you know, a start, even in basic research excellence, let alone across into uh, impact and engagement. And one of the ways humanities make their impact is indeed their books. They operate through contextual synthesis. They pull ideas together and exposit all the elements of it. Not a quick five page article by 400 people, but one person writing 150 pages to tell, tell you about the world as they have now understood it. Each are perfectly valid, but they need to be reflected in the systems we use to, uh, to allow that validity to, to be understood and accepted uh, forward. So I think um, we've still got a, a range of issues here we've got to take account of. There are big issues that could transcend all this. You know, if we, if we adopt the new Bill Shorten policy of 3% of GDP in, uh, in R&D, a lot of impact and engagement will emerge along with a lot of research excellence. But when you can only get 20% success rates in ARC research grants, there's a lot of impact and engagement that doesn't emerge. And just writing a national interest test is not going to solve a problem that could have been solved by recognising the, uh, the return to the community of research as an investment, not a cost. And as was indicated before by the, the nine was it the $9 billion example that somebody gave earlier uh, from one project? When you do this across research as a whole, you get about 20 to 40% rates of return, which is the sort of stuff people in finance like to talk about. <laughs> when the cost of the capital to the government is less than 7% and you're getting 20 to 40%. But that 20, 40% includes a whole bunch that return nothing and another whole bunch that return the $9 billion. Equally, if you look at the returns in areas uh, like social sciences, it's a different sort of measure. Um, the Academy of Social Science put out a, a, a book a little while back called Social Sciences Shaping the Nation. And it's got things in there like if you think what the benefit to the foundations of our society are from a, a Medicare from John Diebel who died uh, a month ago, or from uh, Hicks from uh, Bill, uh, Bruce Chapman, uh, he's got the office down the corridor from me, or uh, the development of um, compulsory superannuation from Richard Downing at Melbourne University, and so on through example after example. I can attach as an economist a huge value to the taxpayers' savings and the broader well-being and welfare of the people of this country. That is a huge payoff from that innovation, from that research that has had impact and engagement. In fact, Bruce's stuff on, on um, uh, income contingent loans has uh, emerged from him being charged with looking at that issue when he was working for Dawkins. Uh, it wasn't from his laboratory, as it were, going to say to government, have I got an idea from you? He did it as an instinctive way of solving a practical public policy problem, and he spent the rest of his life trying to codify it into proper, theoretical, well-attested econometric evidence uh, so that he's doing it the other way around because as an academic he wants to do that too, to understand what he's done well. Uh, and others can then of course be, be uh, convinced. Bruce and I have the idea that one good way of enhancing engagement and impact would be to extend the income contingent loan to um, business R&D. That is, use universities to partner with businesses so that universities would attest they would be the, the, the way of ensuring that the business is a good business and understands and can work with a university. They're not just meretricious players. But rather they could come and work with a university. Uh, you'd have a business advisory panel too, because one of the problems of uh, new ventures is whether you've got the business now to make it work. Uh, and you get a mix of, of funding. You get a mix of um, uh, debt finance. You get a mix of equity from venture capitalists but you would have long patient capital that if the venture ended up failing, you would not have to pay back. But you'd get many of them, most of them, paying back because you're choosing them carefully. They would work with universities to do this, which was part of the guarantee this is something that 
we can be, we know we can make it work. And uh, the rate of return to that compared to straight handouts, because what we do most, mostly right now is give grant handouts, tax concessions to anybody who just claims this is R&D with the right lawyer helping them do the categorization. Mm -hmm. We just throw money at it. A, a system that paid back money to the taxpayer and obliged universities to work with business partners would be a tremendous way of, of taking this agenda forward. So we've got the expert at ANU who can uh, help you design such a scheme, so just go knocking on Bruce Chapman's door and <laughs> we'll look forward to uh, this being established in the, in the budget uh, in, the near, in the near future. So there's a lot of other things I could say. I think we've run out of time. Uh, I, was, I was just on a plane back from Perth writing Ten Commandments for, for making engagement and impact work. Um, yes, like, we do have time if you want to <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wonder. <laughs> um, I'll just see if there's any that are, that are truly, uh, what I think, different or divergent from. Because I was engaged in one of the in engagement impact exercises, the one that looked at taking the metrics and trying to see what behavioural consequences they would have. You know, would people game the system uh, if, if you put these, these metrics into place? And, uh, and, I, and I was sort of a bit worried about this micro approach. Of course you've got to get that right. But what about a bigger picture about how to do impact and engagement? And one other that I have got here that I began to think about is, okay, I want to protect, I want to protect my philosophers. Uh, the, the, they're wonderful. The, the, the things like, I, went, I studied once under John Rawls uh, at Harvard, and I, when I came, came back to Australia, I was helping with getting rid of conscription, and I helped convince the Whitlam government under a Rawlsian sort of argument as to how to move to fully volunteer military. And I found I could do the same later with vice chancellors. I just mentioned to one of my, my colleagues, Dylan, here, that when I worked for University of Australia, we tried to convince the university vice chancellors about what, how to pay their fees. And they, they, didn't, they didn't like any of the formulas we tried to impose on them. That too many would say, look, I don't want to pay the same as the University of Melbourne when I'm Federation University because they get the most benefit. Uh, and others would then say, but you can't just make it equal, we don't all get equal benefit. So we ended up saying, put yourself behind a veil of ignorance like John Rawls would do. You're gonna be a university vice chancellor, but you don't know which one you're gonna be the vice chancellor for. <laughs> what is a fair system now? And what they agreed was a fair system where half of the cost of the organization was the same per university, and the other half was the size of the university. And this was a nice balance. If you ended up in a vice chancellor, whether it was Southern Cross or UNSW, you thought that would be fair if you were the vice chancellor and having it to go along to a university Australia meeting to explicitly put them behind the Rawlsing and Veil of Ignorance and uh, told them what the general facts were and now work out what's fair. And it worked. They, they gave up pretty quickly on that and moved on. So uh, philosophy can even help vice chancellors uh, improve the productivity of uh, their university arrangements. But I would uh, particularly push this idea of um, improving the way in which uh, we can help fund, in conjunction with universities, business R&D, uh, as something that we really should pursue as bigger policy than tinkering with the present policies. And we need to do it systematically. So the, the current shift to reviewing VET as a whole, to uh, reviewing all, all research funding, that's wonderful. Something needs to pull that together, but at least it will be systematic and holistic rather than tinkering around the edges and opportunistic, which has been so evident in recent years. You know, when you decide to pull money out of general research funding for regional universities, wonderful as those regional universities are and need that funding, to just do that ad hoc, taking it away from general research, and, and, and this is bipartisan. Kim Carr used to do the same. Uh, he used to raid the EIF for auto manufacturing in South Australia for the Education Investment Fund. They've got to put it inside a long-term reliable framework because we are in the business of investment. The years that it takes to be a PhD, the years that it takes to set up thorough research programs, mucking around through opportunistic ad hoc policy is the way to undo all of that. And uh, if we can rely upon what seems to be a bit of a change in the environment to make it more systematic, that will be uh, a wonderful way forward. And I'm delighted that the VET mob are in there. Because I think 
if we went to 3% of GDP for R&D and devoted a significant part of the increase to applied research for TAFEs, why not have a bag of money in the block grant for TAFEs that obliges them to do applied research, also have applied research in universities, but basic research in universities. So TAFEs become colleges, truly, and do. They're the ones who know how to work with business. They're the ones that know how to uh, link to, uh, to small business, to professions, to trades. And you might view this as ridiculous. I can see some nodding. But I believe in Boulding's law. If it exists, it's possible. That is, it's what New Zealand and Canada do, and it works rather well. So uh, why not us as well? Uh, so uh, some ideas, anyway, of how to uh, go wide, um, go deep, uh, make sure the system works as a whole. You're not just uh, opportunistic. And uh, in the process, I hope there will be a lot of good consultation. The Australian Council of Learned Academies stand uh, ready to assist the moment that you go straight to the university lobby groups, uh, where we turn ask their managers and you get a managerialistic answer. That's very helpful because people have to administer this. But it would be good to have a scholarly answer too uh, from people who aren't scared of what their vice chancellor thinks, don't have KPIs for their promotion, uh, don't have to uh, uh, toe the line of the university, but can truly speak out as university people should. The combination, I think, would be much more effective. And at present, it's interesting that the Learned Academy is another common source of, um, of consultation, partly because they probably didn't want to be in the past. They were too busy being pale, male and stale and honouring themselves, having sherries together and uh, uh, calling themselves Fellow of the Academy. But that's changing, as it should, and I think that's a source too for better impact and engagement. So thank you for indulging me at the end of a Friday and some <laughs> thoughts I had from uh, an academy perspective on, on these sorts of matters. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to our panel. That was a really interesting set of ideas from everyone. I'll uh, read out the questions I've received on email and after that open it to the floor. So the first question is from Ravana Paul from ANU, who has... Uh, Ravana, since you're here, did you want to pose the question yourself? Um, yeah, sure. Um, yes. So, um, recently I've been um, assessing Marie Curie Fellowship applications for the EU Research Executive Agency. And um, the... The requirement um, for the candidates to include an engagement and impact statement in their applications is, is much, much stronger than anything in a uh, ARC discovery application. So, uh, and and um, it's much more heavily weighted in, in assessors. So, specifically, they have to include. Um, a statement on how the new knowledge generated by the research will be disseminated and exploited outside academia, what is the potential impact outside academia expected to be, um, include a strategy for targeting um, industry, uh, professional organisations, policy makers and, and other peers outside academia and the wider community. Um, Public engagement activities, um, the, the planned public engagement activities have to be outlined explicitly and assessed how they contribute to creating awareness of the research. Um, assessors have to assess explicitly how both the research and the results will be made known to the public in such a way that they can be understood by non-specialists. So. So, um, so this is compulsory and reportable also in the um, fellows' annual and final reports. Reportable. And it occurred to me that if um, similar criteria were included in ARC and NH and MRC grant and fellowship schemes, the entire engagement and impact exercise 
would be redundant. Would any members of the panel like to comment? Yeah, yeah, I don't understand what you mean. Why would it be redundant? So engagement and impact is already built in to the competitive grant scheme yeah. and, and, and accessible and reportable. So it is in the UK as well. But the criteria aren't necessarily the same. And it's also the case that none of those things might actually work in the grant. So you're saying there's, there's too much risk involved and that a separate engagement and impact exercise well, is, is necessary? In, in those um, European systems, you get one chunk of money for doing the grant, you get another chunk of money. There's no money in ERA, but in all the European systems you get money. So essentially you get money to do it, and then you get money when you have done it. So why, what would be wrong with that? That sounds great to me. <laughs> Well, it sounds great to me that, that a very strong engagement and impact um, accessible and reportable statement is required by these Murray Curie Fellowship applications that would go a long way towards um, providing <coughs> engagement and impact in any case and is not um, included in ARC applications to the same extent. Oh, okay, but it, for those Marie Curies, they're EU funded, mm -hmm. and then you're reporting on yes, a national right. level, so they're, they're two different things. So you report back to the EU, but then in your engagement and uh, case studies for REF or for the Belgian RAE or whatever, so, you, so the, you've got two different systems running in Europe. I wouldn't mind having a, a go at answering that. So I guess with the, if you were to have that sort of system in the ARC, you would be saying this is the pathway to impact, whereas with the impact statement, you're actually saying this is the impact we have achieved. Yeah. So it would be That's measuring exactly both ends means. of that scale. So you could be saying, yes, I'm going to achieve impact and engagement by doing these things, but you'll get the money, but you don't have to have that, even if you have it reportable, it takes a long time, it takes a long time to have that actual impact. So when we're looking at making our impact statements, we have our approach to impact that's going back <coughs> a number of years because it takes so long to get there. So, so you might say, for example, you're going to do a play and this play will engage the public in the following way and you, you get money for staging it and all that and you report that you've done it. But actually no one might have come. And if they did come, they might have thrown rotten fruit. And that would be your case study. That's, that's the impact. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's both, actually. But. The other, I think the other, also in the context of a, of a, of a, of a university, the, the impact and engagement assessment exercise is holistic across the whole institution. Um, grant application and grant outcomes are just one component. You know, like um, we talked about Bruce Chapman's output. That wasn't grant funded. We do a whole range of things from whole different funding sources. So there's a need for a broader <coughs> capture of all that outputs. If there's a way that the actual granting system can actually start to frame people's minds about thinking about it so they can write the impact, mm -hmm. I think that's probably a good thing. But I think you know that they're also it's just a small component of, of the broader engagement impact output. Yeah. It would certainly um, inform universities' approach to the a, a separate engagement and impact exercise though, if, if um, grant applicants had, had to write a much stronger engagement and impact section to their application. Yeah, I, and I think what, where it would, might help is in, in <coughs> you know, as we sort of alluded to, getting, getting our colleagues to change they don't like. If they had some, this would help the mindset change, the culture change. And I but think I, that's where the biggest... Yeah, but I think we're all already seeing that to, to a certain extent as I said, being on the College of Experts for the ARC, what's separating the excellent grants from those that are obviously very, still very fundable but not quite getting over the mark is the benefit and that comes back to that potential for impact. And so those that write that section very well are, are the ones that are getting funded. It's still a very weak criterion though because um, my research provided um, the impact statement for the um, maths two-digit four code and and that was part of um, 
research I did for a future fellowship. And if I'd <coughs> the application, if I'd emphasised this impact that it actually had, it turned out it made millions of dollars for this company. Um, I, I don't think the, my future fellowship application would have got up. I emphasised the pure science and it got up. Now, I wonder if you would have been able to envisage that impact right from the start when you I mean, one of the things about research, as you know, is I knew it's it, an under... Yeah, I knew it was pretty valuable stuff and approach yeah. the university intellectual property office. Yeah, so not, not always the case that you... I mean, some of the Nobel Prizes, the pond scum, um, one wonders whether the impact of that research... Had, had that person, you know, been a judge, you know, as to whether or not that research would have been fundable or not, based on their vision as to where this would have gone to and the impact and engagement, whether, you know, that would have been just death. Um, so, I mean, the thing about research is it should be unknowable. Um, otherwise, why, why would we fund it in the first case? And if it is unknowable where it's going to take us, then how can we plot that? I mean, I think the benefit is in having a vision and demonstrating that the eyes are wide open to the opportunities it will come. But um, it's very hard, I think, to before you even know where the research is going to lead you to envisage what that pathway is exactly going to be and then be judged by that later on. M maybe the case for some research, but I've, in my area I'd find that very difficult. That's a big problem with the system. We're blending each of these objectives in, in, in one process. Uh, and, uh, I remember working on some NMH, NHMRC committees where essentially they operate on the basis that we've already done the work yeah. uh, you know, and we're just ongoing getting funded. So here's the sort of work we're going to do. Uh, we'll pretend we're reproducing it, uh, updating it, and then we had to do new work anyway using the cross subsidy of the existing grant. It was just a game they played, even more at the NHMRC than you can at the ARC. But it is you know, blending these criteria, and you don't know how much, as an individual academic, to emphasise you know, genuine excellence you know, in physics and philosophy and so on. It is really hard to know that a concept you're developing has potential engagement and impact down, down the track, uh, as opposed to you know, some immediately functional objective, and yet it's all in the same scheme, with the same forms. I would rather see a bunch more money go as it used to to universities for block grant funding, not just for infrastructure, but for re you know, return to the days when uh, the, the amount they paid for university salaries actually included the one-third teaching, a uh, one-third so research time component. Uh, that's gone. It's, it's only enough to cover your teaching time now. Uh, uh, let alone an amount over and above that to, for university-driven <laughs> imperatives to, to apply to theoretical physics and philosophy. And then the competitive grants be much more consistent with, with these sorts of impact and engagement measures. I think that sort of system of universities knowing what really is a, uh, a clear driving excellence imperative and then the, the grant schemes having mixed and, and applied areas. Uh, so we had another, sorry, are there any further comments on this question? Okay. We had another uh, question on email from Tom Worthington. Uh, Tom, did you want to speak up? Uh, yes, I've got here. Tom Worthington, I'm an honorary lecturer in Research School of Computer Science at ANU. Um, would the engagement and impact be improved by increasing the number of professional doctorates. As the AQF points out, these involve research but emphasise practical outcomes. Yes, <laughs> it would. Yeah, we've got a mass university system. We can do lots of stuff that you couldn't do 50 years ago with a small elite university system. Uh, of course, professional doctorates, which you know, within universities we're very reluctant for cultural reasons to take them up. If you're already producing, you know, 500 conventional PhDs, why not 100 professional doctorates uh, alongside or within that uh, to, to, get, to get business engagement? So that then you can have business supervisors as well as you know, university supervisors and the like. And while you're at it, why not have an extended impact and engagement to a, a, a genuine national internship scheme for undergraduates and master's students? That is have part of their, you know, their work-related practical stuff for arts and sciences students, because we do it with the professions, uh, whereby they get paid an actual worthy amount, half funded by the government, half funded by the private employer, 
under proper supervised conditions so they're not being exploited, and with structured learning components. Yeah, build up the integration of the education function of the university, including research training, and integrate it into engagement and impact for appropriate components. Okay, just to follow on that, someone just asked what's a professional doctorate. Um, <laughs> in the Australian AQF, at the doctoral degree level, which is the top level, there are two types of doctorates. A research doctorate, which is normally called a PhD, and a thing called a professional doctorate, which is normally doctor of whatever it is, which is orientated to people who go out in the industry and work. They still do research, but they also do. Um, it's, as far as I can see, it's a creature of Australia because in the US, no. US is quite common. Um, okay. UK, but there quite is common. there's more an emphasis on these things being promoted. Um, I guess I'd just suggest that if we train people on how to communicate to clients and how to get up projects, um, I just point out Lachlan Blackall, who is running the new um, battery research program at ANU, um, has an opinion piece in the Sydney Morning Herald today to tell the government how to fix the electricity network. And he can say that not only because he has a PhD in this stuff, but he's set up a company to build the world's largest virtual power station. And I'd suggest that will have more engagement and impact than thousands of academic papers on the subject of how to do this. Because he's done it. They listen to Finkel for some of those reasons too. He's been out there and done it come back. Just just on that, I mean, so professional doctorates is one way. Um, there, I don't think there's been a huge take up of professional doctorates in Australia, for whatever reason. I think that's a reflection on industry. I think the industry profile in Australia is not conducive to a, a lot of professional doctorates. Um, but while you do see it in, in the UK and in, in the US, I think another way, another element to that might be to say, okay, well, how, there's two things. One is, how do we actually get more of a experience within a, in, a, in a conventional PhD that is not just about academia, there is actually a broadening. The reality is, you know, only, only maximum 20% of our PhD graduates are ever going to be academics. They're all going to go out there. And we, you know, we really don't prepare them well enough for that. So I think that is, is an area that could, could you know, be enhanced more. And then I think the flip side of that is within academia, actually um, creating structures where we can get people like Lachlan to come back inside the university. And then at the ANU we've introduced these entrepreneurial professors to try and address this. And I think, you know, if, it's one of the things that struck me when I came from the UK, um, um, is that the permeability between business and industry and even government in Australia, I mean there's a huge wall, whereas you go to the US or you go to Europe and the UK, people move in and out of academia and business and industry much more freely than they do here. And I think that's partly a mindset on both sides of the fence. By outside, they see anybody with a PhD as being an academic, and they just got no relevance. And inside the the, the academia, we just don't see you know so anybody that's been outside and comes back in is just a lesser being or lower worth. And you know, I think those are the cultural things. And I'm not sure a professional doctorate gets around that. I think some, addressing some of the other elements might do that. Well, if I just say, as I understand it, the ANU approach to this is to sort of sneak elements of the professional doctorate. In sneak. Terms of, mm -hmm. In terms of practical skills into the PhD programs. Um, yeah. there's, there's been a move, I think, at Cole that led, led the move into getting more transferable skills okay. into PhD programs. Um, along the line of the UK experience, the problem is that the funding didn't, for the extra time required, uh, wasn't actually provided, which was a, a big barrier to it. And um, there's an opportunity cost. While you're learning transferable skills, you're not learning as deep. That's not true. That's not true. And Alan Finkel makes the same mistake, if I could say so. <laughs> uh, so you're in good company. I'm good company. <laughs> 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 Which may well mean they're right and I'm wrong. But uh, um, well, Alan, you know, with his recent stuff at the school level about math, you know, stick to pure teaching math properly and don't, none of this nonsense of, of generic skills and soft skills and so on. Haven't got time for that. Good pedagogy allows you to do both. That is, if you can assist uh, math teachers, or put it more generally, university teachers, let's take STEM, uh, 
to teach by matrix teaching, which, which is sort of the way you organise your class, where you use syndicates and you use you, you assess leadership, you build on cultural diversity, and yet you still teach rigorous content. But you, it's, it's a little like using case studies as well as you know blackboard and <laughs> chalk uh, to teach stuff for so long before you know half the lecturers could be could even be brought to using whiteboards instead of blackboards. Uh, but if you, if you improve the teaching skills of a key group of, of lecturers who in turn can use soft skill enhancement to convey rigorous understanding, in fact the rigorous understanding can improve as well. Because a lot of unmotivated students actually, if they're working in groups and talking with each other, not just sitting there, the very best ones you know, sit there and actually love the intrinsic content. But, the, but many of the others actually like to be organised better to learn. And they can you, can you can test or enhance or use those other soft skills while conveying core skills. And I think we, we don't quite realise that in, in, in you know, so many of us just teach in the conventional ways and don't want to change. And of course, you know, academics resist the notion that they should be taught to teach. It's not the teaching bit, it, I'm, I, you know, it's the content. That's what matters, that's why I'm hired. And uh, we, we're, at our, we're at our expense resisting that because then the employers keep coming back every year with the graduate outcome survey and they say, you're not producing work-ready graduates. And we answer every year, well, you're hiring them and you're paying them good salaries. And we go through this ridiculous ritual whereby we blame each other. You know, you're not, you're not graduate-ready and we're not, uh, we're not producing work-ready uh, graduates. If we did some sort of combined pedagogy and teaching better, we'd solve that problem and stop yelling at each other about whether we're producing the right sorts of graduates. And at least we'd get that off the agenda every year. Thanks. Um, Wendy Russell, I'm a visiting fellow at the Centre for Public Awareness of Science and a consultant as well. So um, a number of you mentioned um, academics being resistant or ill prepared or whatever. So I'm wondering what academics need and might make use of. So do they need kind of tools, um, best examples, that kind of thing? Do they need training professional development? Um, do they need support um, in finding impact pathways? Or, or do they need, or do we just need carrots and sticks and it all work its way through? I'm wondering what people think. So I think they do need all of those things. Um, I think toolkits for impact are very useful that allow people to kind of track their project against things that um, that they might do. Um, toolkits that allow them to understand the relationship between what is essentially engagement and how engagement can mature into impact. Because I do think that there are a lot of examples of people having very good engagement practices, but then not being able to take it on to the next level. And I also think that funders need to be serious, um, if you want impact, about how much impact can cost. Um, so it, you know, it's, it's all very well encouraging people to have impact plans, but you have to recognise that, that that's expensive, or can be expensive. And, and so you've got to load that into the grant in the first place. Um, and if you're doing work that is essentially not grant funded, you might well need access to some small amounts of soft money in order to be able to, to get engagement and then get impact. These things don't come um, cost free. I, I think there's an issue with um, academic understanding of business requirements. Uh -huh. So of the, of, the, of the leads that I'll bring in to the university, probably less than one in three will actually get up in terms of forming an ongoing viable partnership that creates research and benefit for the business. Um, you often get divergence where uh, the business gives up uh, and moves on and then the researcher comes back two years later with, well, here we are. And the business <laughs> is saying, well, I'm actually three cycles past that, so thanks. <laughs> but, so I, I think, I mean, it's an unfair story, but the point is, um, I think that there's a need for a professional class around the researchers. So this, there's an old saying, you should have a dog so that you don't have to bark. And I think the smart people who are doing the research should be allowed to research and there should be a facilitation role um, to actually bring about those partnerships because 
Um, quite frankly, those people are at the cutting edge of research because of their research capability, not because of their business understanding. Yeah, yeah they're totally different Charles. skills. Yeah, you, yeah, need, yeah, a, totally you need a translation. <coughs> yeah. I think this is, um, and I've just no feel, I think this is where perhaps when Nick, when it was set up, got this right, you know, there's fundamental research and then there was the engineering. And, you know, there is a balance, in it, and it, it actually you need more engineers than you need new researchers. So if you're going to do translation effectively, you need, as you say, that professional class, and that needs to be funded, and it's expensive. And that's invariably what we forget, is that they think, you know, that the researchers are going to do the translation, but the reality is you need a, a cohort of people that can really access that interface. Yep. We would like to, just one last question. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I have a Bill Robertson. Um, I used to be a mentor, as, as a mentor. I've been in various other places, about half my life on the industry side and about half on the uh, public sector side. Um, my experience is, I think Mick's absolutely right, you do need that mix of skills to have greater confidence that you can engage effectively and then have impact. But, you know, I've made the observation that um, I seldom, I've seldom seen deep engagement not leading to impact of some sort, and I've seldom seen um, impact arising without deep engagement. Um, I've seldom seen good case studies from individual academics that are convincible um, at the early stage, partly because, you know, there's an Ecola report, I think, remember, the fifth in the series that points out that whilst, you know, you can be sure that technology will have an impact on society and often a very big impact, you can't predict ahead of time which ones are going to and, and, and how to best drive them. Um, at best, that's, you know, pretty chancy. And so, you know, it means that centres where they've got a group of researchers and groups of engineers and other people are much more likely to have compelling narratives about impact um, and enough pathways that you can, you know, you're going to see some of them realise over 15 to 20 years. Um, then for an individual academic putting up one pathway, it's just pretty difficult to see that. And, and I think that that's why I think I question this current system that we're embarking on, except that it does make people think about the whole process of engaging and of what impact they might have. And in my experience, smart people who start thinking about that then start looking to engage in a more, uh, a deeper way, and you know, perhaps with drawing on support from people who've been in the industry. Um, I just make one other comment. It's, it, I think it's very difficult. I think, you know, in the US and Canada and places like that, there are, there are probably four times as many master's students as there are PhD students. And the master's students are generally the biggest bandwidth in and out of industry. Uh, that, and I think that we, we miss that in Australia. Um, and I, you know, we need the PhDs, but I think we're missing the fact that there's lots of people who are doing a master's half the time based in industry. I think the Ballarat example is great. You know, it's been going for a while now with IBM. And, mm -hmm. and, and so I think that we need to think about those conduits that get people moving across the boundaries. And I've taken quite a few people from academia and from CSO into industry, and then they find it difficult to get back in, particularly to mainstream universities, to include great universities. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a message there that we have to be much more open to encouraging people to go to and from, because that's how they build up the content networks, uh, but actually then you can put together a plausible uh, pathway to impact based on that, and you can go and talk to people you know and they trust you and you can engage straight away. So. Thank you very much. That kind of brings us to the end of our panel discussion. Um, just a quick comment because of uh, I was a, for a decade I used to handle technology transfer at Intel Corporation and a lot of the discussions of the panel sort of reminded me that there is a spectrum, right? You've got researchers where uh, their discipline and their research can lend itself to technology transfer and to understanding what the impact might be, but there are other disciplines and other researchers who would not know and in fact, the academia really attracts people who are attracted by the sheer curiosity of wanting to know what next or what's there for it. And to force those academics to think about potential benefits is probably doing a disservice to uh, the national research agenda. So I think a balance needs to be set and a process needs to be set that doesn't try to be all things to all kinds of research. So on that note, we'll end here. Uh, we do